a long time, there was a disconnect between how we imagine robots and the reality of robotics. We imagine robots cooperating with humans, interacting with us to achieve tasks, or augmenting our natural physical abilities. But for decades, um, robotics in the real world meant industrial machines that operated in isolation from humans. Recently, people have started to bridge the gap between these two versions of robotics. So robots are moving out of the factory and into our everyday lives. They are helping doctors to perform surgery. They are helping people who are paralyzed to walk. They're even replacing lost limbs and becoming a part of our bodies. But I think most people still feel a little bit apprehensive if we think about working this closely with robots. And that's pretty natural because you know, robots, like all machines, malfunction sometimes. Um, and I think you know, the technology will obviously continue to improve, but we'll never completely get rid of all errors. And I think the bigger problem isn't necessarily that the machines malfunction, but it's about the materials we use to build these robots. So robots are usually made from hard plastics or metals, but humans, we're made from soft, squishy, bendy, stretchy materials. So if we want to think about robots that interact with us, that come in contact with us, it seems to make sense to think about building robots from similar soft materials. So soft robotics is a growing field of research. Um, soft materials have the advantage that they're very good at handling delicate objects like uh, raw eggs or human tissue. And it also means that they're, if they do malfunction, they can't do too much damage. They can't really hurt anyone. Um, it might be surprising, but they're also pretty robust. Uh, so they can take a lot of punishment without being damaged. And that, that might seem counterintuitive, but if you think about dropping your laptop on the ground, you're going to worry about breaking it. If you think about dropping your favorite piece of clothing on the ground, it's no problem, right? I mean, soft materials can change their shape without any permanent damage. So today I'm going to talk about some examples of soft robots, um, and I'll start by talking about soft actuators. So actuators are the active part of robots. They're the parts that cause movement. Um, there are lots of different types of soft actuators, but in particular, I'm going to talk about robots that are air-powered, so powered by air. And what this really means is just balloons that do interesting things when they're inflated. So uh, if we think about a simple party balloon, when we inflate that, it just expands in all directions. It's not very interesting or useful. We can make it more interesting by combining it with a mesh like this that behaves like a finger trap. So if you push and pull the ends, you can change the diameter. So if we wrap a mesh like this around the outside of our party balloon, then we get an artificial muscle that gets shorter when it's inflated. Um, so some of our students use these kind of artificial muscles to create a robotic wrist device that could assist people who had suffered a neurological injury. Um, the wrist is a pretty complex joint. It has lots of different motions. And the students figured out a way that they could just use four of these balloons, and depending on which balloons you inflate, you can achieve all the different types of wrist movement. It's shown here on a, a, a mannequin arm, um, but the device itself is very lightweight and comfortable because it's just made out of fabric and some balloons, so very simple. Obviously, there's muscles throughout our body, so there's lots of different potential applications for these uh, artificial muscles. On the left here, we can see uh, another student project. This is an implantable device that was meant to uh, assist the heart with pumping blood while somebody waits for a heart transplant. On the right, we can see work by Dr. Ellen Roach, who's currently at NUI Galway. She's done a lot of fantastic work on soft robots for the heart. And here we see part of a cardiac simulator that she made that tries to replicate some of the complex motions of the heart. Um, and what's really interesting is that by turning off some of the muscles, Ellen can simulate different heart conditions. Other soft actuators work in a similar way. So we take a balloon and we add external reinforcements that change their motion. So here we have a custom-made balloon that we have cast in silicone rubber. And again, you can see when we inflate it, it just expands. If we stick a layer of paper or fabric to one side of the balloon, now that side of the balloon can't stretch anymore. So we get this bending motion. You can also see, though, there's this kind of bulging going on. And that bulging represents wasted energy. So we want to get rid of that. So we wrap some fibers around the outside of the balloon. That gets rid of the bulging. And now we just have this nice, clean bending motion. What's interesting is that we can vary the types of motion just by changing how we apply these reinforcement layers, so the fibers and the fabric layer. And um, the, the only input here in all of these cases is just pressurized air. So a very simple input, we can get interesting output motions. 
What's really interesting is that we can combine all these different motions in a single balloon. So by changing how we apply reinforcements at different points along its length, some parts of the balloon can bend, some parts can twist, some parts can extend, and so on. Uh, another of our student teams used this idea to create a device to assist the thumb during grasping tasks. So that this is, again, a complex motion. You need some twisting down here at the base. You need some bending over the knuckles. And your skin also stretches over the joint. Um, but as I said, we can achieve all of those motions with a single balloon. So the students did some nice work on this. A team of researchers at Harvard has developed this work on and turned it into a complete assistive glove with actuators for every finger. Here we can see the device in early testing with a stroke survivor. You can see unaided, she has a lot of difficulty picking up and moving the blocks. But when she uses the glove, it becomes a lot easier for her. And so obviously, this is related to the wrist device I showed earlier. You can see we're kind of gradually building up a complete arm device. Uh, another team of students wanted to encourage infants in this kind of exploratory motion. So it seems like the, the kind of random kicking behavior that a lot of babies do, uh, that helps them to build up the neural connections that are required to control movement. But some babies don't do this behavior. And later on, when they're learning to walk, they have a lot of problems. So, so this team used these balloons to make this lightweight, comfortable, safe baby suit that would give babies a little nudge to engage in this behavior. Um, so I've talked so far about these soft structures that have air chambers inside them. But what if we fill the chambers with a conductive fluid? Now we have sensors that are soft and squishy and stretchy, just like our own skin. So uh, a, a team of researchers at Harvard have you know, used this to create a, a essentially a wearable motion capture suit. Obviously, this would have applications in, in gaming and industry, but uh, it's also very important in physiotherapy to evaluate movement. Sorry. Um, OK, so I seem to have skip, skipped a slide somehow. Um, so we've made a bunch of different medical devices out of soft materials. Um, I hope that those couple of, of quick examples give you, uh, you know, an idea of the impact that soft robotics could have on healthcare. But I'd like to finish up by talking about some related STEM outreach work we've done. So the Soft Robotics Toolkit is a free website where we share all of our knowledge about how to build and operate these soft devices. We originally made it as a textbook for uh, our students in our undergraduate medical device design class. But we decided to share it to see if other students and research groups would like to use it. And you know, this was kind of an experiment, because we had no idea if anyone else would be interested. Um, almost two years ago, we launched. And in the first few weeks, we got a lot of media coverage. Since then, a lot of people have visited the website. I know for those of you who work in web development, these numbers aren't very impressive. But this is a, you know, a very niche area. And we have a marketing budget of zero. So we're pretty happy with the response. Um, but we wanted to see how people were using this and what they were doing with it. So last year, we announced a, a competition where we asked our website users to just document their own projects, their own designs, and put them up on the website. We got responses from high school students, uh, engineers, artists, and robotics research groups. But I think you know, some of our favorite entries were from younger high school kids, like this teddy bear that hugs you back when you squeeze its belly. Um, or this, uh, <laughs> this glove that can detect and reduce hand tremor. Um, we had another high school student, Simone from New York, who um, set up her own company to build and sell some of the open source designs from our website. Um, she also started a soft robotics meetup group with over 100 members. She came last summer to work with us and build a soft medical device. And starting in September, she will study engineering at Harvard. So these stories are, are great. We love these. But interacting with high school students also highlighted some problems for us. So when we built this originally, uh, we were focused on engineering students that had access to specialized equipment. Making soft robots usually involves casting silicone rubbers in 3D printed molds. Um, but you know, the silicones themselves are cheap and easy to find. But the molds themselves can be very uh, costly and time consuming to make. So now we're trying to redesign the process to make it more accessible. So one approach, this is from Oshin Byrne, a student of mine in UCD. He's done fantastic work on trying to print the actuators directly so we can get rid of the molds. We don't need complex fabrication anymore. Um, so this is a low-cost 3D printer that Oshin has modified so that now it can print the balloon and the external re reinforcements in a single go. Um, another approach we're taking, which is very different, is to design molds that can be built out of 
cheap materials like paper and cardboard. And one advantage of this is that we can share these designs via PDF templates that students and teachers can print on paper and then assemble out of glue. We're also making IKEA-style visual instructions that will be easy to follow for younger kids. So we've been testing these instructional materials in workshops with kids around the world. Two weeks ago, we were in Peru, uh, where we did a workshop with 20 high school students. Um, and we found the cardboard molds were great uh, for a low resource environment. We also found that it really supported open-ended design activities. So after a little bit of training, we just told the kids to go wild, build whatever they wanted. They came up with great things like a CPR robot that you can see here. Um, and they were able to, in a few minutes, design and build custom molds in weird shapes, and that wouldn't be possible with 3D printing. So we're going to continue developing and sharing these instructional materials so we can engage young people in building soft devices for medical applications. If you'd like any more information, please visit the website and get in touch. Thank you very much. Want to be in the audience next time? Click here for tickets to InspireFest 2017.